All right, try that again. Good evening, everybody. All right, tonight we're jumping into the new, the next period, the Sardis Church period. Um, it will be broke up into three parts, and then we'll go into, uh, like I, I've got it circled up there. We only got five more classes to cover that. Some of you were surprised, but uh, I'm trying to work through it and give you a good foundation to get started. And as I said, we can we can go back and visit again. Anyone wants to, we can go more in depth. I mean, you could spend literally years on this stuff at one night a week if you wanted to, but uh, this will at least give you good groundwork, good start, good foundation to go with. And uh, outside of showing you the two biblical lines, I think the other big thing I would want or hope you would take away from this, and we'll look at really towards the latter end of all of church history study, will be other denominations. Now tonight we will delve into the Muslim religion, uh, kind of where we're at in church history. we gotta we got to address that and deal with it. <clears throat> so tonight will be kind of laying the groundwork for the Sardis Church period. Then we'll have two sections. And next week we will really, really focus on uh, the Bible-believing line. We've kind of just hit on that periodically here and there. Next week we're going to really look at the Bible-believing line, the true Bible-believing line of groups and individual men. So if you've been waiting on that, you're going to get that next week. We'll focus on that. Probably be a little bit of a long service next week, looking into that because we're gonna we're gonna focus on our line, your roots, where you come from. As a Bible believing Baptist, we will be looking at that next week. So uh, looking forward to that. But tonight we start the Sardis Church period. Uh, their name attached with them is Red Ones, 1080 to 1500 AD. Now I've got a lot of reading I've got to do tonight, um, so we're gonna we're gonna run through this uh, as quick as we can. So we finished up Thyatira. Uh, which is the first 500 years of the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages runs 500 A.D. to 1000 A.D. We've seen the Roman Catholic Church become the pinnacle of world power, and we're right up at 1000 A.D. now, and this is the height of the Dark Ages, where we're at now. It's the height of it. So uh, it also starts our fifth church period called Sardis. The word Sardis, mean, Sardis means <clears throat> red ones. You'll find that in Revelation 3. So where we're at will be in Revelation 3. One through six, and unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he, that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, so here's this will be kind of this will play in not not so much tonight, but looking at next week. Thou hast a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So. We, we're, we begin, we've seen a lot of things developing, and we're going to continue to see things developing. Uh, we've traced the development of those two lines very well. I feel like you should have a good uh, grounding of, of the two different lines there, the biblical line, the anti-biblical line. Now, in dealing with people, you need to keep in your mind you've got anti-biblical people, biblical people. Then you've got the ones in the middle we call compromisers. Don't forget about those three types of people but also those two lines there that we're, we're running with here. But we, those two lines should be pretty clear. The, this period is the primary period. I've told you guys time and time again that it's covered very well in the Fox's Book of Martyrs. This, this time period we're at now, you can, you can find out a lot about that in terms of uh, descriptive martyr, the martyrs that took place or the martyr that took place on uh, the true Bible believing line. You find that right now, the wheelhouse for that would be Fox's Book of Martyrs. I know some of you have ordered it, already got it in. I don't know if you've started reading it. I think one of you has for sure that I know of. You do yourself a very, very in, bad injustice not at least reading the Fox's Book of Martyrs one time. It is a piece of history. It is gold as far as I'm concerned. It is a book that a lot of people would silence or keep away if they could. Uh, I've read accounts of where they used to teach that in some uh, school classes and public school education years and years ago, but you can rest assured now they're not going to teach that for nothing. So uh, you, you want this period of time laid out in great detail in terms of uh, the slaughter side of it, and it's rough to read. I mean, maybe not for everybody, but it, I mean, it, it is 
a little gruesome, a little stomach turning, a little uh, burdensome, make you a little sad, but it also gives you an understanding, your roots, where you come from. So Fox's Book of Martyrs by John Fox, once again, great book to help you out there. It basically covers this time period. Uh, he's got a little on either side of that in it, but, but the main wheelhouse there is right there. So tonight we're going to jump into the Crusades and laying the foundation for the um, Sardis Church period. We give you a lot of you've heard of the Crusades. We kind of mentioned it briefly a couple of weeks ago in dealing with that. But I, like I said, I got a lot of reading tonight and a lot to give you. So one of the things that we're going to see is the real key to understanding church history. Uh, you can't you can't separate you can't separate the God of the Bible from the God of history. And I've I've told you guys that several times. But in Genesis one, before you've gone four verses, you find the issue is going to be light versus darkness. Light is going to be God, 1 John 1, 5, we know that, and the darkness is going to be the devil, Acts 26, 18, we know that. But we've, we've, we've never, I've never done a study on this. You've got what's called the gap theory, right? And some of you have heard that. Some men, like Dr. Ruckman, they say you're crazy to call it a theory. It should be called the gap fact. And the gap theory is this. It's between Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 2. And that concept of the gap theory is how much time spanned between that, right? And, and this is... Uh, I don't want to say it's crucial for any sort of argument to, you know, the evolutionists and, and carbon dating and all that that say the earth is 6 million years old, but it would help give some insight if their testing was right and if it was accurate, which it gets debunked all the time. But when you've got something like the gap theory coming into play, which is very, from my studying, I, I would lean towards a, it being a gap fact, um, but but nevertheless, it's not something that we would hold to as doctrine where if you don't believe in the gap theory, you're a heretic and you should be abolished out of the church. But what I'm telling you is this, between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, has anyone got their Bible with them tonight or bring it up real quick? Give me give me those two verses real quick. I, I mean, I can quote them. I could paraphrase it, but I don't want to do that. Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Read me 1-1 and then 1-2. Stop, and now one, two. Uh, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So see what you've got here, the, the, the method to all this madness, is in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Pause, rest. We, we, the, the, there's no defin, the definitive time there as far as after he created the heavens and the earth, how long until he started forming and creating everything else as we see it today. And so... Uh, if you do any amount of studying on that, you can find some of that reference in Job and places of that nature. And if it's something y'all are interested in, maybe we can do, do a topical study on it one night. Um, like I said, it's not its not doctrine. It, it, it's just not. It's not something you have to believe in. It's essential in order for you to go to heaven, right? And it's not something you have to live your life by. But it does springboard the Christian into all sorts of I don't want to say crazy, but very interesting things in terms of always the battle with scientists and things like that. But but that's the gap theory in a nutshell. How much time from in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth until Genesis one two when things start to kick off and He starts you know starts doing things. One of the reasons that I would lean towards the gap theory uh, would be right here because Satan tried to overthrow God and take his throne, that, that would be a great time lapse for people in their mind to sort of try to figure out when all that happened. It would be in this time span for many reasons. I'm not going to cover them all tonight because we're not learning gap theory. We're here for church history. But Lucifer, before he fell and became Satan, had a throne in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem has always been the hot spot all down through history. And you know this, when the Antichrist shows up, he's going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. That's in 2 Thessalonians 2.4. That is what the devil wants. And, and, and we, we're, we're not going to understand every detail between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, but there's just so many things playing into that that would help bring a lot of clarity to things that we don't necessarily have an answer for all the time uh, due to sometimes our lack of, of knowledge of things and things that, I mean, it, the, the gap theory was very crucial in a lot of areas. I want to I put that in there, even though it's not doctrine, it's very crucial, but uh, we're not going to understand every detail Nothing like that, but but we know this much. The devil lost his throne, and ever since then, he has wreaked havoc on, on, on God's creation. It's always been a you know him against the king of kings. He's always tried to do something to stamp out the seed of Jesus Christ. You can see that all through the Old Testament, if you're looking for it, where he tried to kill somebody or have somebody killed. That would be the lineage of Jesus Christ to try to stamp that seed out because... 
that's the one that's that's gonna that's gonna have the throne. That's that's whose throne it is. So he wants it back. Um, in the tribulation period, he sits on that throne himself. That event is called in Matthew twenty four fifteen the abomination of desolation. All down through history, the issue is going to revolve around Jerusalem. So with that in mind, we're going to look at the Crusades. Now something, I might come back to this later, but here, here's just a fun food for thought sort of thing. When you look at everything starting in the Garden of Eden, life as we know it, or creation in mankind as we know it, and we know that God, the Holy Spirit, travels. Does anyone remember the direction he travels? East to west? East to west. And so when you look at that, and you look at history, and you look where we're at today, as far as history, even secular history is concerned, from even what they'll teach you, we have almost made a full circle and come right back around to where it all started. And so that's real interesting in the concept of the Lord coming back. Just a little food for thought. But the Crusades have been called a series of holy wars. It's because the Crusades, and a lot of people don't know this, it's, it's the reason of the Crusades, and, and many people probably don't know this, that the Muslims hate Christians the way they do. That's because of the Crusade. That is essentially why Muslims hate Christianity today. Now, uh, they're not fully right uh, in their hatred in that aspect uh, to label all Christians, but I'm going to give you that. They look at the Roman Catholic Church, and they don't make a distinction between you and I as a Baptist and them as Catholics, and therefore they hate Christianity in general, in, in, in its entirety. They despise it. They just look at what the Catholic Church did, and the Catholic Church has claimed to be Christians. They lump everybody together, and they hate all Christians because of what happened during the Crusades. I mean, we, we see stuff like that happen all the time with guns. They one, one bad person does something with a gun, they lump all gun owners together. That's sort of the same concept tonight with, with you as a Baptist versus the Muslims. Now, uh, I know what their religion teaches. I know a little bit about the Quran. I've not read it cover to cover. I've just read tidbits here and there when I come across something to reference, see if it's accurate, see if what I'm going to speak out against is accurate uh, or not. And, and I know enough to know that they would still despise you, but their, their ever-loving and hatred towards Christianity night is because of the Crusades, and, and it's all because of what happened there. Um, just, just some history. When George W. Bush referred to the Iraq War as a Crusade, everybody threw a fit when, when that all happened, and 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 they said it's referred to. Um, it's, it's because of the ling lingering memories of the Crusades that they hate anything remotely associated with Christianity. They refer to it as holy wars. But they're no more holy than, than Hitler's attack on Poland or Great Britain. There was nothing holy about it at all. But you, you got to get some of this stuff tonight. So from the Bible standpoint, the Crusade, Crusades are nothing more than the Roman Catholic Church through Perp, Perp the Sec, Perp, Pope Urban II trying to steal and get dominion over a piece of land that up until this time... He wanted but couldn't get control of. You need to mark that down. That was the land of Palestine. And the city that he wanted was Jerusalem. This is the whole background for the Crusades. So the Crusades in the nutshell is this. The Pope trying to get Jerusalem and he can't get it. And all this paves the way for exactly what the Antichrist is going uh, to do. Now here, here's you a little bit more history on top of that. You're going to find when you study the Bible believing groups that they all knew what the Roman Catholic Church was. You need to get that down. All, all, all through history, when you look at the Donatists and the Monetists and the Novatians and the Albigensians and the Waldensians and all those groups we've talked about, we're going to look at a lot of them next week, they all knew, they, they called the Roman Catholics bluff right off the top, man. They seen it, and they called the Pope for what he was. They all knew that she was the great whore of Revelation 17. They all called the Pope the Antichrist. They were very open about it. They preached about it. Uh, if my mind served me right, I believe it was Martin Luther who addressed the Pope as your most hellishness. I mean, he did not have any regard for the Pope. They, they called him the Antichrist. They preached about it. Now, you and I today, we know the Pope was not the Antichrist, but they knew the association. They figured that out real quick. They, they Even back then, before we had all this higher education and all this technology, we found all this wisdom that has never been known before. There was a group through the ages or groups through the ages that could spot the Roman Catholic the church and the Pope for what they were. They knew how to, it, it was real simplistic. They was able to look at the stuff mentioned in Revelation about the great whore of Babylon, and they was able to say, well, that lines right up with that. And so they called it right out. They picked it. Every, every Pope of this planet was and still is a forerunner for the Antichrist. Plain and simple, no ifs, ands, or buts about it, because they... Uh, 
every pope of this planet is a forerunner of the Antichrist. They knew exactly, those people knew exactly what the Antichrist is going to do. And these Bible-believing groups knew that. And that is why the Roman Catholic Church hated them so much and slaughtered them and persecuted them the way they did because they didn't reverence them as the true church or the, the perfect pope and, and the vicar of Christ. They knew it was a bunch of baloney, man. They didn't buy into it for a second. So basically, the Roman Catholic Church has gone back and rewritten history in any way they can. I mean, there's a lot of allegations floating around out there. Some have been proven. Some are still floating in the air about their attempts to rewrite history, change things, and, and mess with that. Why? Because they want to cover their tracks. They're, they're trying to absorb everybody and get everybody they can, and you're not going... That's why you won't learn about Fox's Book of Mormon. I think it was Cindy that was messaged me the other day and said just so much stuff we, we didn't learn. And, and there's a reason for that. They, they, if they was to teach you anything out of the Fox's Book of Martyrs in, in, in a secular school or a public school system, anybody with half a brain would say, I need to stay away from the Roman Catholic Church. There's a reason they don't teach that stuff. You, you've got a church, Satan's church, that's going to be the, the forerunner, the, or, or not the forerunner, it is Satan's church, and it's going to be inevitably what, what absolves and becomes the one world religion, and so they're not going to be able to show you or tell you things that's going to discredit them in any way, shape, or form, and they're going to do everything they can to stop that. So the Crusades are basically, after it's all said and done, 500,000 to upwards of a million dumb Roman Catholic kings, vassals, peasants, knights, and lords who let somebody else take care of the religion. They were taught through Origen, Augustine, Jerome, that all the promises of the Old Testament were allegorical. We've looked at that. Remember, Augustine was the first to teach the concept of predestination. Only difference between him and John Calvin was he didn't teach individuals as predestined. He taught that the Roman Catholic Church was predestinated to run the world through Rome. And so uh, you're starting to see all that play in and, and become a factor of things now. Uh, should be coming a little bit clear to you. The Roman Catholic Church didn't believe in the restoration of the nation of Israel. And when they adopt the teachings of all millennialism and post-millennialism, post uh, they come to the conclusion that well, Rome will bring in the kingdom of heaven, not Israel. So the next logical step would be that Rome should have Jerusalem. That's, that's why they're thinking the way they do. We're going to be the ones that bring in uh, the kingdom of heaven, not Israel. And if we're going to be the ones that do it, then we need to own Jerusalem. We need to be the ones that have it. That's the way they're thinking. So they reject the restoration of the nation of Israel, which is found all through the Bible. They go on this fiasco to obtain the Holy Land, which calls, which history calls the Crusades, in order to make Palestine a Roman Catholic Church state. Once they get the Holy Land in possession, they will be in position to fulfill their post-millennial belief by bringing in the kingdom themselves. That's what they want. You've got, you've got to get that tonight. It's an absolute fact of history. You've got to get that down. Roman Catholic don't believe the Jews are... If there's anything left for the Jews, as far as they're concerned, kill them all. That's why they um, they give a concordance. They signed a concordance with Adolf Hitler, who was going to kill a bunch of Jews. Heinrich Hilmer, all those old boys, they were in deep with them because they don't think that the Jews are the ones that murdered Messiah. They need to be killed. And, and why? while there is a, a, a problem with the Jews to an extent in that area... You and I are called to pray for the, the peace of Jerusalem, of Israel. We're, we're to regard them. We, we are to uh, you know, bless them in terms of uh, not hate them. We, we, we are to take care of them. They are still God's people, and he is going to spin back around and take care of them. You've got to get that tonight. That is biblical, foundational, doctrinal truth. During the tribulation, that is what's called the restoration of the nation of Israel. That is when God turns from the Gentiles back to the Jews. See, all through the Old Testament, it was Jews, Jews, Jews. Then up until Acts at the stoning of Stephen, it was still about the Jews. And then whenever Stephen preached, and, and, and I'm giving you stuff that ain't even in history and, and in my notes tonight, but when you see Stephen getting stoned there, it says he looks up and he says, I see the, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, standing at the right hand of the Father. Now that may seem like an insignificant detail to you, but here's what that teaches you. The Lord was fixing to come back and bring it all to a halt right then and there. If the Jews that Stephen was preaching to would accept him as Savior, he was standing up ready to come back. They refused, they stoned him, they killed him, and it was done and over with. Now we know scripturally he's seated at the right hand of the Father, and God has now turned over to the Gentiles, you and I, the Greeks, or we're, we're called that as well. He has turned to us. This is the church age, the age of grace, where we get to hear the gospel, we get to preach the gospel, we get to live and share the gospel. But when he comes back and takes the church home, the church age is done. Now he turns back over to the Jews, thus signifying the restoration of the nation of Israel. That That's deep doctrine things that I don't got a lot of time to spend on that because we are in history. 
But you need to get that little nugget about Stephen looking up and Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Because you and I know him is seated. Why was he standing there? Uh, what's he standing for? He's fixing to come back and get and, and wind it all up. It was going to be done over with. The, the, we, you and I, wouldn't we, we'd be without hope today. It would have been a done deal, uh, inevitably, at least the time of the Gentiles as we know it. Uh, but nevertheless, it didn't happen. They rejected him. So he sits down. He's waiting on the Lord, to, God the Father, to say, go get him. Go get him. And it's all done and over with. So, and, and, and here's something we, we do. We, I mentioned this word doctrine a lot. And it does doctrine matter? Is it important? Well, absolutely. Because missing one Bible doctrine, like the Catholics have, like the restoration of the nation of Israel, and, and it's not a little doctrine to miss. I mean, it, it is found through the scriptures time and time again. It's nothing to miss. But it cost over, at least over 800,000 young men their lives. Just looking at things like the Crusades where they're trying to get that land, missing one Bible doctrine led to the slaughter of over 800,000 young men because they missed one doctrine. So this New Age generation, these charismatic whack jobs that tell you that doctrine is irrelevant, you need to not worry about it, and you're just a legalist, they've lost their flipping mind, man. Doctrine is important. It is talked about. It is preached about. Paul warned Timothy several times to be preached doctrine, sound doctrine, all the time. And, and you're in a generation where any, nobody can care less about doctrine. So you got to get that moving along the rise the rises of islam and you want all you and i know islam we know all about islam or at least have an idea of it we know them as, as terrorists most of them and while i'm sure there's decent decent muslims that ain't necessarily wanting to kill everybody i'm sure there's some of those the the, the root of the real just like catholicism you, you may not be knocking everybody individually but you're knocking the system you know everything islam is not your friend in their regards and i shared that last night with this coexist garbage you see Ladies, I told you this last night, go live under Sharia law. You want to coexist. Go see how you like Islam and Muslims and all that stuff and see if it's something you like. But the rises of Islam, the period for the life of Muhammad is about 570 A.D. to 632 A.D. He is born in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. He claimed to be the 70th, 70th son of Ishmael, which Ishmael's the son of Abraham and Hagar. We know that from our Bible. For those of you that are not familiar with the Old Testament, we're, we're going to go back real quick and we're going to look and see how the devil was coordinating the events. The devil has a better perspective of the future than, than you or I do, except the Lord. Everybody else except the Lord. The devil's got a good perspective of it. He knows what to do. He knows what's coming down the line. So the devil, the devil knew his long-range plans. When God came to Abraham and wanted to give him the promised seed, the devil knew that this was the chance to give Israel all the problems that he could and hopefully wipe them out. So the devil intercedes and gets Abraham to take Hagar, which is Sarah's handmaid. If you're not familiar with the story, you go back to the book of Genesis, read about that. God told Abraham, Abraham and Sarah they was going to conceive a child. He's, uh, he's 100 years old and, and Sarah's 90, I believe, at the time. I could be a little off there, but somewhere in that ballpark. And Sarah laughs. And God, why did why did I laugh? And, you know, I'm, I'm well stricken in years. I can't have a kid. And so they get impatient. God gives them a promised seed. They get impatient. And she says, I'm far beyond years. I can't have no child. You go into my handmaid, Hagar. Maybe, you know, I, I don't know that this is exact, but maybe that's what God meant. Maybe maybe that's the promised seed. So that's what he does. And Ishmael is born. That is, that is Abraham's first son. And, and, and Ishmael is born, but he's not the promised seed and the devil knew that this was his chance to give them all the problems so here comes ishmael sometime later god brings the promised seed isaac we know that we know that isaac is the line of the lord uh, of the lord jesus christ and that he is the chosen seed remember i told you the devil did things to the old testament try to stamp out that seed that lineage of the lord jesus christ that was one of his attacks right there get abraham to go in cause him a bunch of fits maybe it'll split him and sarah up and they won't have no kid and there that'll be the end of it there will not be no lineage for the Lord Jesus Christ. But nevertheless, everything worked out. The promised seed came, just like when God promised his son, he came. So what Muhammad did, you need to get this, what he did was reverse the process. He claims that Ishmael was the promised seed. So they have to change the Old Testament where it reads that Isaac, I mean, they, they do all this changing. Uh, but I, I don't got to go into all that. But that's inevitably what he teaches, that he that actually Ishmael was the promised seed and, and Isaac was the one that, that, that shouldn't have happened and it was all wrong and we're all backwards. So Muhammad gets visited by an angel who claims to be Gabriel when he is 40 years old. Probably like the same angel that visited Joseph Smith of the Mormon church, but nevertheless, he claims he gets visited by this angel. This angel gives him the sacred writings, which become the Quran. In Joseph Smith's case, he got the Book of Mormon, same sort of scenario. They're all very similar. Muhammad goes through some trials with his new faith, but by the time he dies in 638, 632 AD, his religion has spread all, all throughout Arabia. I mean, 
as far as I know, it is, and Jeremy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it is the fastest growing religion right now in our world is Muslims, if I'm correct. I, I haven't looked in a while, but it is the fastest growing religion. Do what? It surpassed Catholicism. It surpassed Catholicism, so there you go. I mean, buddy, that one's, that one's took. His religion was now called Islam, which means, Islam means submission to Allah or surrender to Allah. The religion follows a basic outline. There's one God, Allah, and his prophet Muhammad. What they basically do is create another God and another son of God. They basically produce a counterfeit of the real God and his son, Jesus Christ. And, and you need to remember, they're, they're 570 years after Christ's death. I mean, it ain't like this is, uh, you know, right on the brink of it, and this all just popped up. This is 570 years later, um, after his death, burial, and resurrection. Everything that they do is an afterthought. They come up with a fake God, Allah. They have to fake a son of God. So Muhammad claims the title, Prophet of Allah. They take a lot of things out of the Old Testament, make changes to it as it fits their newfound religion. So just, just a little tampering with the Bible here and there, and you've got a whole other religion now. Uh, we've got their connection to Abraham. I covered that briefly. But they have to go back to Abraham, and some people don't get this. But but Jews and Muslims, they both claim Abraham is the father of their faith. So um, th there, there's not much difference there in terms of who they claim the father of the Father Abraham, those little kids you sing that song, Father Abraham had many sons and all that. that that's what the Christians sing. The Muslims claim Abraham is the father of their faith. And, and Abraham was the father of Ishmael, so they're not wrong in terms of where they came from in, in regards to Abraham. But... Uh, but he married an Egyptian named Hagar to produce Ishmael. And this is where you run into the problem because that's where he violated the principles of God because his promise seed was supposed to come through Sarah. God made him a promise that Sarah would have the child. And instead, Sarah said, I can't do it. You're going to have to go into Hagar. And there he broke that. He violated uh, the principle that God had given him. And that's where everything went all out of whack. And so uh, if you ever look at some things, and I'm, I'm not going to read through all this tonight, but there's just some very weird, weird Weird things about the Islam religion outside of killing anyone that's an infidel or doesn't believe in Allah, which is what the Quran states. So there's some very weird stuff. I'll read you one of them. Uh, it, it's a well. This is a volume. This ain't even in the Quran. Let me let me correct that. But in in let me make sure here. Yeah, hateth. This, this be the Quran. Uh, Bukhari, book seven. Hadith 590 says, The climate of Medina did not suit some people, so the prophet ordered them to follow his shepherd, his camels, and drink their milk and urine as medicine. So they followed the shepherd, that is the camels, and drank their milk and urine till their bodies became healthy. Then they killed the shepherd and drove away the camels. When the news reached the prophet, he sent some people in pursuit. When they were brought, he cut their hands and feet, and their eyes were branded with heated pieces of iron. I mean, it, this is the weird stuff. This is just one drop in a bucket, brethren. I mean, there's some weird stuff in that, and I just wanted to give that to you to give you a little, little bit of something there. But now we're going to look at their prophets. They have the belief in a future life, like when you die, like you and I believe, uh, of seeing Allah, much like we believe going to heaven. They recognize that Moses and Jesus Christ are divinely inspired prophets. Muslims believe in Jesus Christ as a person, and they regard him as a prophet. They just do not regard him as the Son of God. So something to get. They reject him as the Son of God. Basically, they take the aspect that Muhammad was a prophet and Moses was a prophet. They have... They have to have Moses in there because Moses was the key that brought the whole thing together after Abraham. At the same time, they don't make Jesus Christ the Son of God. They accept him, but only as another prophet. They claim six prominent prophets, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. That, that's the six prominent prophets that they will claim. And so you, you want to pin that down if you can. I know I'm going fast, but I got a lot to read and give you tonight. So if you don't get it, it's on Facebook and, and YouTube and all that stuff, so you can go back and slow it down and pause it, whatever you got to do. We'll look at their prayers. They pray five, five times a day facing Mecca. Their first prayer is before sunrise. Second before noon, or is at noon. The third prayer is during mid-afternoon. Fourth prayer is just after sunset. And the fifth prayer is performed at night. Now we'll look quickly at their holy cities. They have three holy cities. Mecca, Medina, and believe it or not, their third holy city is Jerusalem. Mecca, besides being the birthplace of Muhammad, is important for another reason. Because in 621 AD, Gabriel appears again to Muhammad and takes him on a night journey to the mosque in Jerusalem. The Quran says in 17.1, Glory to Allah who did take his servant for journey by night 
from the second mosque to the furthest mosque. The sacred mosque is generally accepted to be in Mecca. The furthest mosque, Islam claims, is the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, which was built in 689 A.D., and yes, that's 68 years before it was built. The account goes like this. One night the angel, Gabriel, came to me bringing a white horse. On this horse I traveled first to Jerusalem from where I ascended to the heavens. They know uh, they know he was there because they found a footprint of Muhammad there. If you go there today, the footprint is on display. So five times a day, they will roll out their little carpet facing towards Mecca. Give you a little background. They, they found his footprint, so they know that was him that was there. I mean, I know that technology back then had to be real good, and they got him, they got him pinned down. Uh, polygamy and slavery. They believe in polygamy. If you don't know what that is, that's multiple wives. I don't know what man on God's green earth would wish that upon himself. Uh, nothing against the ladies, but I've got one. I'm content. I'm satisfied. I don't need six more with six different moods and six different trains of thoughts. Just my personal preference. I'm satisfied with the one I've got. Amen. Just like you women, probably got all the husband you need tonight. Amen. So they believe in polygamy, multiple wives. They believe in slavery, and they spread their faith by the sword. They have no problem killing anybody that is not one of theirs. And you hear me, well, that, the, the Quran don't say that. In Quran 2, 191, it says, Enslave them wherever you find them and drive them out. Such is the reward of disbelievers. Disbelievers, what do you mean? People that don't believe in Muhammad as, as God. That, 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 that's plainly what it says. Now, uh, you say, well, see, I think Muslims, they got their religion. You got your religion. We're all headed the same direction. Right here, you've got such a vast difference in the two they can't be the same. You don't find anywhere in the kingdom of the Bible uh, in the New Testament under the, the church age where you're called to go and recruit somebody or proselytize them by killing them uh, because, or you won't convert them, but you're told to kill them that don't believe the way you believe. That, that is the opposite. America today, a lot of people think America is the biggest threat to, to freedom and people that, that ever existed and we're the problem. And we're, we, we don't go kill people that don't agree with us. You let the Muslims in and see how you like that one if they're true Bible-believing Muslims. I'm talking about their Quran and put quotation marks around Bible. I'm not trying to blaspheme nothing. But you, you take a true Quran-believing Muslim, let him carry out what he's supposed to do, and you tell me who's more of a threat to society as we know it today. Amen and amen. So they believe in that. Uh, they have they have no regard for human rights whatsoever. That's why I told, I ain't trying to pick on the ladies, but that's why I told the ladies last night, go go do a little research on Sharia law. Go see how you like all that stuff. They have no regard for human rights, period. Uh, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know the accuracy uh, technically because I don't live there, but I've read a lot, a lot, a lot of different cases and statements that over there, women, men are actually what is used for pleasure and the women are just vessels to carry the babies. That, I don't know how much truth is to that, but I've come across that many of times. So as far as women is concerned, they could care less. They, children. Huh? Children. Oh, children, yeah, big time. Uh, they, they get that from the prophet. He, he married, I think he married a 9-year-old yes. or a 14-year-old. I forget how old she was. And so, yeah, that, that, that's where all that stems from. So Islam's built on six pillars. Declaration of faith, daily prayers, charity or almsgiving, fasting during the month of Ramadan, pilgr pilgrimage to Mecca, and jihad, the holy war. And so, uh, you know, we see that that holy war stuff technically. I mean, there's always something going on in the Middle East. There's always fights. There's always wars. Uh, if you go back and read that account of Ishmael, uh, God told him that his man would be against every man's hand. I mean, he he give it. I mean, and that's how the Muslims are. They're against everybody. I mean, they're always fighting with somebody, but. Uh, they accept the Torah, which is the five books of Moses, Psalms, and the four Gospels, but the Quran is their final authority. In other words, they do the same thing everybody else does. They accept the Bible, but they have another book that supersedes the Bible because they can't find what they want in their Bible, so they need to find another book that lets them fit it all together the way they need it. They hate Christians because of what happened during the Crusades, especially the third one. That's why I'm trying to hurry tonight because we're going to look at all eight Crusades, and I don't don't. Don't start sighing. I'll get through them real fast, but we're going we're gonna to look at them in, in as fast as we can. But uh, the definitive passage in the Bible on the Palestinian question is found in Galatians 4, 22, verse 4, verses 22 through 30. That, that is, this is God's official statement on Muslim and what's going on in the Middle East. And I'm just going to give you verse 30. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. The bondwoman is Hagar, the, the, and her son is Ishmael. We know that. I mean, Paul lays that all out verbatim right there. But you get that in Galatians 4, 22 through 30. Um, when Muhammad shows up, 
This is where the next major religion gets formed. The Muslims are going to take over the Middle East and engulf everything. Uh, in about 1000 AD, the Ottoman Empire formed. We'll study, we'll look at the Ottoman Empire and things like that a little bit later on, but the Ottoman Empire runs the Middle East until World War I. They cease to be a nation after World War, World War I when the Ottoman Turks sided with the wrong side, and at the end of World War I, they are devastated, and they're over. They're, there's nothing more to them. Within 30 years of Muhammad's death, 661 A.D., somewhere within 30 years, Islam had been conquered from Tripoli, which is northern Libya, all of Saudi Arabia to the eastern border of Iran and up into modern-day Turkey. But now we're going to look at a problem that comes from a historical standpoint. During the same time, there were many Catholics that were making pilgrimage as well. Uh, to the Holy Land, and many were going to Jerusalem on a yearly basis. These pilgrimages had been encouraged by Origen, Jerome, Helena, which was Constantine's mother, and many other prominent leaders of the Catholic Church to them, even though they didn't have direct ownership of the land. Their mindset was that since they belonged to God's church, uh, they, the, the Jerusalem was their city. And so now you'll start to see sort of the feathers fly. Uh, we, we'll be looking at that here shortly, uh, but or, or right now, actually, sorry. The worshiping of relics. Also during this time, the worshiping of relics had become a big deal. Many Catholics were making their pilgrims to the Holy Land and finding things that they thought were associated with Christ. The worshiping of relics had become part of the Roman Catholic Church. They still do that stuff today. It had gotten to the place where kings and popes were now going to the Holy Land and they were basically showing up and stripping the place of everything they had found if they thought it had to do anything with the Bible. So it's like this. Uh, in regards to the, the Middle Easterns and people of that land. Then you've got the Roman Catholics now coming. It'd be like me going into Sean's house and saying, well, because I'm an American and you got this stuff, uh, I'm going to take it. it. Kind of the same sort of grounds there if you want to look at it that way. I mean, I hope I'm painting that as good as I can for you. But they didn't have any business in that place to begin with, and they're going in there and stripping it and taking for what they want because they thought it had something to do with Christ. You need to keep that in your mind. I mean, you you, you got to get that down. I told Nick earlier, if God if God will make this way, and I feel like he's really been pressing this on me, I'm going to bring sort of a, a video sermon. Uh, I'll preach, but I'm going to have some clips in it. And, and, and it's going to be stuff regarding AI. I mean, we're getting into some real weird stuff with AI and the ability to twist things. And, and I don't think a lot of people are really getting how big of a problem this poses for people today in America. I don't, I think, is there handy things that you could probably get out of AI? Absolutely. I mean, there, there's, I'm not going to act like I'm so high and mighty that I don't enjoy some of the things of modern technology. But does the pros outweigh the cons? Absolutely not. Not, not in a million years. I, I would even venture, and some of you may disagree with it, but I would, I would even venture to say the cons of internet has not outweighed or the pros of internet has not outweighed the cons. I would venture to say that tonight. And a lot of people disagree because that's how we're all connected. This, I mean, brethren, they did this year. They were, people were connected and things functioned before that. I'm not saying there's not been luxuries. I'm not saying there's been, not been benefits. I'm not saying that. What I'm telling you is I don't believe personally. IMO, I think that's the modern tech slang for that, in my opinion, that the good outweighs the bad that comes from that. And, and you say, well, I disagree. That's fine. But I look at things on all kinds of different levels. <laughs> Before the Internet, you had less adultery. That's right. Just a simple fact of life. It, it just, yeah. It's just a reality. So I don't know why I ran down that rabbit trail, but I'm just telling you, these people, oh, because the Catholics thought that this was associated with Christ, and so they're going to go take that back and tell people, here it is. And, and, and we're going we're gonna to look at that here real quick. They're going down there. They're finding all kinds of stuff. They find Christ's baby teeth. They find his adult teeth. And, and this is a fact. By 1500 AD, there are 7,000 teeth that supposedly belong to Jesus Christ in Europe. Now, that's a problem, brother, because it don't seem to bother anybody that 7,000 7, teeth a little extreme. I mean, that dude would have had a mouth like unrealistically to have 7,000 7, teeth in your head. Even if half of them were baby teeth and the other half were the old teeth, they don't compute. They don't add up. But that's, that, that's mankind in, in his entirety. They don't, they don't investigate. They don't pay attention. We found some more of his teeth. No one ever stopped and said, hey, let's add this up and see how many teeth we're up to now. And then realize, oh, we're, we're umpteen amount of, you know, thousands of teeth over. Somebody's lying. Somebody, somebody's wrong. And, and nobody stops to do that. But it don't seem to bother anybody. They find John the Baptist's head. They found Mary's girdle. They found the, the finger. They found the finger that Thomas thrust into the side of Jesus Christ. If Believe it or not. I don't believe it, but they found it. They found that same finger that he thrust into the wound of Christ. 
Christ. They found pieces of the cross that Christ was crucified on. By the time you get to 1508, 1580, there's enough wood to build Fort Apache. I mean, they found so much wood that was part of the cross, you could have built 16 mansions out of it. I mean, it's just unreal, and nobody stops and says, wait a minute. Something's not adding up. You, do, you see that in this generation. Just like through the pandemic, nobody ever stopped and said, wait a minute, something's not adding up. Something's not computing. We don't ask questions anymore. We don't ever stop. And just, I, I think one of the biggest problems outside of people not reading anymore is nobody asks questions, ever. Right. We never stop and say, it, does this compute? Is this, could, it, even, even if it does, and there still may be some concern, let's stop and make sure that it's even feasible first and then do something with it. But we, we, we don't. We just say, nope, the media said it. Nope, he said it. Nope, they said it. And they're people of power. They're people of great and mighty wealth. And they've got a position. I don't give a flip what Bill Gates says about nothing. As far as I'm concerned, he's a computer creator, man. I ain't got no use for what he says on anything to do with health. Has he went and learned something? Possibly. I don't know. I don't care. But I'm just telling you, nobody asks anymore. Nobody says, is this right? Is this accurate? Hey, they found 18 million pieces of wood that, that belonged to the cross of Christ. Let's put all these together and see how big that cross was. Oh, wait, it's 700 feet tall and 4,000 miles wide. That don't add up. Somebody's lying. And when you can figure that out, then it helps you seek truth. It helps you say, maybe I'm being lied to and I need to stop and take another look at things for a minute. And we all ought to do that. As Bible believers, and I'm not saying you got to critique the Bible, I'm not saying that, but in everything you come across in life and society, you need something to say, maybe I'm being lied to about something. Maybe I, and, and, and even when you get saved, you have to do that with the Bible to this extent. Before I got saved, I thought there was a whole lot of things in the Bible that I find out now ain't even in there. Things you've heard through the years and stuff, and it's not even in there. So you got to stop and say, I've heard this my whole life. Is that right? Is it accurate? I mean, I, I see that in people still to this day. People saying, well, the Bible says this, and, and you're not supposed to do this because this is this and this. And it ain't even scripture. That's right. Okay, it might be a good saying. It might sound good, but let's quit saying that's what the Bible says Amen. if we don't say it. And, and, and that's where we got to get that stuff down in our head. But people don't stop and ask. And I, I guess I'm preaching a little bit tonight, and I'm trying to hurry. I'm sorry. But stop. Just That's why you're here tonight, church history. You're basically stopping and asking what's right, what's wrong. You can disagree with what I'm teaching you, and you can agree with what the world teaches you, or vice versa. It's no skin off my teeth. But I've just come too far, and I've seen too much now for me to close my eyes and turn a blind eye to it and pretend like everything's hunky-dory. I ain't buying it. I don't buy it for a second. And so that, that's why you're here tonight. And like I said, you're an American. You're, you're, you're free to disagree. You, you, you're free to disagree with some things and not all of it in entirety. I mean, that, that's just the way it is. But I'm going to give it to you like I've, I've received it and like I've studied it. And what I know and feel like the Holy Ghost of God without a shadow of a doubt has bared witness with me, that is church history. That That is truth. That is where it's at. And, and yet there might be some things that through the ages have been handed down, little details here and there, minute stuff. But I, I'm talking about foundational things tonight, brethren. We, we've got them. We've got them. I don't doubt that. And so, uh, like I said, but they found one of John the Baptist's arms. Not really sure if it's the right or left one. They found a thorn from the original crown that was on Christ's head when he died. They found the original towel that he girded himself with in John 13, 4. They found the head the, James, the head of James, the brother of Jesus, that was killed by Herod in Acts 12, 2. They found a tear that Christ had shed in a jar. And, and we're going to say the best for life, for last. They found some of Christ's original blood that was shed for you and me. See, that's why you need to yoke up with a Catholic church, man. They've got all the OG stuff in layman's terms. They got all that original stuff. They've got the original. They've got the original. That's what they tell you. But uh, they're going down there. Sorry, uh, Joyce. They're going down there like an uninvited mother-in-law showing up at your house on vacation. <laughs> but you know, I got to make the joke. I got a mother-in-law. I enjoy her, and Joyce seems pretty cool. So I'm just picking at her. But Sean, don't ever tell me nothing any different, or I'll tell on you. So they're, they're, they're just going in there taking over is what they're doing. They're going into a place that's not theirs, and they're taking what they want, and all the while coming back and saying, here's some of Christ's teeth, here's his baby teeth, here's John the Baptist's arm, here's this, here's that. No one has any proof for it. They're just telling you that. Right. Plain and simple. So they, they, they're taking whatever they wanted because they thought it was theirs to take because of one doctrine they refused to, 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 to believe and accept, and that is the restoration of the nation of Israel. That's not a thing. It's coming through us, and it's us, so we're going to take it. And so uh, 
all this going on, I told you this was starting to lead to feathers being ruffled. All this stuff going on in the Arabs and the Turks start to put an end to the plunder. They're tired of people coming in and taking stuff that don't belong to them. Like any decent American said, I don't want people coming in here and taking stuff that don't belong to them. And so it causes a problem. These Roman Catholic pilgrims are beginning to be assaulted. Many a times they're killed. The Pope couldn't have that happening. So he decided to do something about it. And here comes Pope Urban II to save the day. Around 1100 AD, a Pope named Urban II 1042 A.D. to 1099 A.D. is sitting on his golden throne hearing about all the trouble that the Turks are causing for the Catholics, making their pilgrimage, pilgrimages to Jerusalem. And he begins to get worried about this, so he gets an idea. He starts an urban renewal program. He decides to settle the issue once and for all, and now you're going to get to see one of these big fancy councils pop up, the Council of Clermont. Clermont the Council of Clermont. He calls for the Council of Clermont, November 18th, to November 28th, 1095. November 18th to November 28th, 1095 at Clermont, France to deal with the rise of Mohammedism according to the uh, Fulcher of Chartres, which is a chronicler of the First Crusade. Urban II said, let, do, let those who have been accustomed unjustly to wage private warfare against the faithful, talking about themselves, the Catholics, now go against the infidels to end and end with victory this war which should have been begun long ago. Let those who for a long time have been robbers now become knights. Let those who have been fighting against their brothers and relatives now fight in a proper way against the barbarians. Let those who have been serving as merchants for small pay now obtain an eternal reward. Let those who have been wearing themselves out in both body and soul now work for double honor. I mean, what a speech, man. What a powerful speech. At this council, Urban claims that all Catholics are the elect of God. He claims that all the Muslims are the accursed race. He promised the, that the kings... Of, he promised the kings of Europe if they would lend them, lend him their armies to free the holy city of Jerusalem from the cursed race of the Muslims, that God himself would lead the armies. I mean, what a promise. If you'll lend us your armies, you got my word that God himself will lead these armies and everything's going to be a-okay. And you need to kind of, you, you don't have to document all these promises, but keep them in the forefront of your mind because it'll play into something here shortly. But he's making all these big promises. And here's another one. He says the seas would open up like they did for Moses. He promised that God would move mountains and perform great miracles. And to all who fight in this war, they would receive an incorruptible crown for fighting. Needless to say, he gives a speech. The theme for the theme of his speech was God wills it. I mean, what a speech. It, I mean, it, I, I say this all the time, and I, I, I'm not hailing Hitler as a great man, but this man's giving a speech like Hitler. If you've ever watched Hitler give a speech, some of the old videos you watch, the man could preach. Now, he wasn't preaching the gospel, but in terms of getting up in front of a group of people and laying something down, the man could do it. He could fire people up and rally them up, and that's sort of what happens here with Pope Urban II. And uh, it, it, his, his speech, and I've got this highlighted and took down. It almost sounds like Adolf Hitler at the Nuremberg rally when he was slamming Poland and calling the Jews the accursed race. Almost a very, very similar thing. Uh, Hitler's speech really wasn't original. I mean, it's almost like a gleaning from Pope Urban II. But when he got to the end of the speech saying, God wills it, God wills it, he brought that place to such a frenzy that they were yelling and screaming like the Germans at Nuremberg. Uh, of course, the Crusaders fought under a cross, just like Constantine and Hitler fought under a cross. All these similarities you're starting to see pop up. Urban promised eternal life to all those who fought and died in battle. Not here's the Pope, the, the, the father of the one true religion, and he's telling people they get eternal life. They are guaranteed eternal life if they'll fight in battle. Nothing to do with getting born again. Nothing to do with receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Nothing to do like that. You go and, and wipe these people out so we can have that land, and you get eternal life. And so he promised them that. They were made some promises too. Uh, the Muslims were promised eternal life with 70 virgins. So we, we know some of that still very predominant today with them thinking. But needless to say, more morale is high amongst the troops. I mean, they're getting all kind of promises. They're getting 70 women. They're getting eternal life. They're getting all this stuff. And while they're fighting, they're going to get to see the sea split just like they did for Moses. God's going to lead the battle. I mean, he's got them all hyped up and all fired up and ready to rock. So, uh, and, and, and I'm going to say this before we start looking at the Crusades. In all honesty, the Crusades were the biggest tragic joke that the world has ever seen. Honestly, at the end of the day, biggest tragic joke the world has ever seen. While Urban is over here at the Council of Clermont saying God wills it, on the other side, the Muslim world was saying it is the will of Allah. The Crusades very plainly and clearly summed up is like this. 
God wills it running right up against the will of all law. So it, it's just a complete, utter failure, waste of time in, in, in all reality. Just, just a tragic joke. So here's the first crusade, 1095 A.D. I'll read the names a little slower in case you're taking notes because I didn't write them out. The problem with being left-handed is when you write something on the whiteboard, if you need to go back and write after you've already wrote something, you're in big trouble. So I, I didn't put the names down. I'm going to give them to you. The First Crusade, 1095 A.D., it's led by Walter the Penniless of France. That's Walter the Penniless of France. Yes, penniless, like you ain't got a penny in your pocket. Walter the Penniless of France and Peter the Hermit of France. Peter the Hermit of France. Those two men led about 40,000 men to the Holy Land, most of which were butchered and slaughtered by the Turks. Walter the Penniless goes into Hungary and gets clobbered. Peter the Hermit goes into Constantinople and gets slaughtered there. The slaughter is so great that the Turks pile up the bodies into a great pyramid. Reinforcements show up under a guy named Godfrey of Bullion, Robert the Duke of Normandy, and some others. They did a little better. They captured the cities of Nic Nicaea. 1097 A.D. and later Antioch, 10, 1098 A.D., when disease, famine, pestilence, and desertion, uh, desertion sorry, began to decimate their ranks, a priestly accidentally discovered the spear of Longinus, which had pierced the side of Jesus Christ on the cross, taking heart. The crusaders eventually took Jerusalem, 1099. So lo and behold, they find the, the spear that pierced the, the, the side of Jesus Christ on the cross. And they take heart and they overtake Jerusalem. So um, there you go. And I'm going to throw this one in for free tonight. Um, in On July 15th, 1099 documented, uh, just because I know some of y'all get into this stuff. While fighting the battle for Jerusalem, believe it or not, a UFO show shows up right in the middle of the battle. So I'm just throwing you one that out there for fun. Uh, what was that one, date? Uh, July 15th, 1099. I might have said 16th. July 15th, 1099. Lo and behold, a UFO just... Pops down right in the middle of that battle. You say you think it did? Probably because of what's going on. <laughs> there, there, there's a lot of evil stuff taking place, and UFO would be uh, demoniac stuff, principalities and things of that nature. So uh, very well could have happened. But you've got your first one of your first recorded UFO sightings all the way back then. Uh, oh, get ahead of myself. Uh, Jerusalem falls. The act that followed could only be carried out by murdering, murdering a bunch of Roman Catholic followers that exist down through history. This is why the Muslim to this day hates Christians. I know you're not a Catholic, but in their mind, that's all Catholics have said. For you, we're the true church, we're the true church, we're the true church. He's the vicar of Christ, he's the vicar of Christ. And so they just lump everybody up, Baptists, anybody alike, with Christianity, and the Muslim hates Christians. It was because of the very first crusade. That's what started that. When Jerusalem fell the first time and all the Catholics got the upper hand, the carnage was indescribable. The Jews in Jerusalem were burnt with their synagogues. Turkish soldiers were promised mercy if they surrendered, only to be butchered in cold blood. Maybe may be hard to hear. Turkish women and children were decapitated, disemboweled, and thrown off the walls of the city. I mean, this is doc you, some of you all, if you've been reading Fox's Book of Martyrs, you're already starting to get some of that. You're already starting to come across some of that. Perp Urban, Pope Urban II dies two weeks after the fall of Jerusalem, so he didn't have time to move into the temple of God, you know, him being the Antichrist, like everyone thought, like the Antichrist is going to do. The Turks never forgot what the Catholic Church did when they captured Jerusalem. It was a bloodbath. In a rage, they butchered and killed everybody that they could. Godfrey of Bullion becomes king of Jerusalem. He is succeeded by a guy named Baldwin of uh, Boulong. I think that's how you pronounce that. They set up a Latin kingdom as occupation forces came in from Europe, and they built castles all over Palestine to help bring in the kingdom. So Baldwin of, of Boulong, that's 1100 A.D. through 1188 A.D. 1188 A.D. that he is overtaken, king, or that he, he rises to power. 1100 A.D. through 1188 A.D., Baldwin, B-A-L-D-W-I-N of Bulogne, uh, B-O-U-L-O-G-N-E, sort of like Maloney almost. But uh, the Second Crusade, 1145 A.D., it's led by Conrad III of Germany. That's Conrad III of Germany <clears throat> and Louis of France. Conrad III of Germany and Louis of of France. Conrad III of Germany, Louis of France. The Second Crusade was led by two kings. I'll just give you their names. 15,000 French and 20,000 Germans headed for the Holy Land. Famine, disease, and enemy attacks along the way whittled down the ranks before they got to Jerusalem. Instead, they attacked Damascus 
in Edessa, but they didn't take it either. So famine and all this stuff comes in, starts to eat away at the ranks and all that, all the enemy attacks, and, and instead they attacked Damascus and Edessa, but they didn't get it either. Uh, a Turk named uh, Saladin arose, a Turk named Saladin, he arose at 1138 A.D., and united the Muslim world, leading them against the foreign army of occupation. Saladin joins battle with a guy, with guy of Lu, uh, Lusignan at the Battle of Hatton, and that's on July third, eleven eighty seven A.D. The Crusaders were the Crusaders were whipped in a humiliating defeat because the holy warriors. Um, let me get my words back. The Crusaders were whipped. In a humiliating defeat because the holy warriors, quote unquote, were carrying the true cross of Christ. That's what they said. Who um, who could ever stand before the true cross of Christ? Apparently, Saladin found a way to do it because he whipped them. They, they weren't carrying the, they weren't the true cross of Christ. They wasn't nothing to them, and he whipped them. So, uh, one of the things you're going to see when we get done with the Crusades will be how. God used the failure of the Crusades, so the Crusades were bad, but he used the failure of the Crusades to bring about the Reformation. We ain't to the Reformation yet. We're going to be getting there, and like I said, that, that, that's, that's my bread and butter. That, that's what I like to study more than anything. All this stuff's good. It's helpful. Give you some background, some foundation, but like I said, the, the, the Reformation and all that, man, that's where it... So people, and here's why. People came back from the Crusades. I told you to remember some of the promises he, were make, he was making to them. People come back from the Crusades, and, and they were disillusioned. The Pope had made all these promises, and none of them came true. And so God used all that, all them lies and all them false promises the Pope were making to get people in the mindset, these, these guys are a bunch of liars. We were promised all this, nothing ever happened. So they were told, and, and like this, they were told their way of life was the greatest on earth. We've got it better than everybody else. They said that the rest of the world was mindless barbarians that were starving to death. They get over there and, and start fighting these wars and, and, and invading these places. They see silk for the first time. They saw inventions that they never Ever imagined possible, and they realize they've been lied to. They're, they've been they've been completely sold out. Like buying a like buying a dead gum frozen TV dinner looks good on a picture, and everything looks good. Then you open it, like Barry Spears gives that analogy, and it don't come out nothing like it looked in the picture in the front of the box. And that's what they so they did. And God used that. They got God fed that right in uh, to the Reformation. So the Muslims under Saladin retake Jerusalem and the Holy Land. But there is a notable difference when the Muslims defeat the Catholics. This time there is no butchering. You need to get this. This time there is no butchering of innocent women and children. That, that's a big difference between what the, Catholic, the way the Catholics did it. It seems that the God of Salad, Saladin has more self-control than the bloody God of the Catholic Pope. That, that, that's interesting to me, that the, 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 the Catholics were not above slaughtering women and children when they went in, and then when Muslims regain power and they start slaughtering the Catholics, it's just man-on-man -man war. They don't go in and murder their women and their babies. They got a little more coof, I guess you could say. Um, but but at the end of the day, that's kind of interesting to me, almost as if really the Catholic Church really is Satan's church because he is a god of that would do something like that. But the Third Crusade, 1189 A.D., this one should ring a bell. Third Crusade, 1189 A.D., it's led by Richard the Lionheart of England and Philip Augustus of France. Richard the Lionheart of England and Philip Augustus of France. I think we, I mean, we covered them a very, very minutely, but Richard the Lionheart of England and Philip Augustus of France. This is the most famous crusade. The third crusade is the most famous one because when you think of Robin Hood, Lady Marion of Sherwood Forest, that all takes place during this crusade. It's the same time frame, so it's one of the most famous. But uh, Richard the Lionheart, you know the story. Richard the Lionheart is off fighting the crusade while the mean sheriff of Nottingham is taking over. The little guy on the bottom is saying, where is King Richard? If King Richard was here... Uh, if King Richard was here, this wouldn't go on. King Richard is off fighting the Holy War. Richard the Lionheart fought against Saladin, who was one of the greatest leaders the Muslim ever had, hands down. The Crusades, uh, in, in, here's a book I plan to try, to try to get it. The Crusades, The Flame of Islam by Harold Lamb describes, describes King Richard in these words. Moody, plotting, rather stupid at times, but on the battlefield, he was the most fearless man alive, Richard the Lionheart. In one account... Uh, he is, or let me get that right. Yeah, King Richard, the Lionheart, in these words, moody, plotting, rather stupid at times, but on the battlefield, most fearless man alive. In one account, he is fighting his way through the battle. When he gets there, he realizes he, he left half his men trapped in the confusion of the battle, so he fights his way back to his men to get them. All the while, he has two horses shot out from under him. As he is lopping arms off and legs off and cutting 
torsos in half. King Richard is the only man that Salad never feared. I mean, this, for lack of better English, he was a bad dude. I mean, it, he, yeah, he might have been, uh, what was the word he said, rather stupid. But a lot of times those people that are rather slow in the head, you get them in a situation like that, <laughs> and you see things take place that you, they just they ain't got no care, man. They're no fear. So he runs in there, he's lopping people, having horses shot out from under him. And he does that just to go, get, go back and get half of the troops that he left behind and get them unconfused to bring them through the battle. So, yeah, I mean, he's a big deal, but just something worth noting. He's the only man that uh, Salad never feared. But this crusade was intended to get Jerusalem back, back from the Muslims, and despite all the lit literature that glamorizes this, this, this wonderful crusade, it was a complete failure. They did take Acre, which is a town north of Jerusalem on the coast, where the crusaders got the true cross of Christ back, which the Muslims had taken. They took a few other towns, but they could not take Jerusalem. So Richard signed a peace treaty with Saladin to protect the Catholic pilgrims. So inevitably, I mean, in all regards, sort of a compromise. We'll, we'll sign a peace treaty and all will be well, but uh, save some men's lives in the middle of that. The Fourth Crusade, 1202 A.D., it's led by Enrico Dandolo of Venice. Enrico, E-N-R-I-C-O, Dandolo, D-A-N-D-O-L-O -L -O of Venice, and Louis of France. Louis I of France. Enrico Dandolo of Venice and Louis I of France. The Fourth Crusade, once again, was a flop. They didn't get Jerusalem. Instead, they captured Constantinople, overthrowing what was left of the Greek Orthodox Church, thereby converting Constantinople into a Latin satellite of Rome. Constantinople was the second choice to Jerusalem, but when all is winning, you apparently just take what you can get. Uh, they're trying to show you that they're making some progress by, by, by noting that down, and we took Constantinople. They're not making any progress. They didn't, get this, they didn't get Jerusalem. But they did capture and send back to Rome some things that were very important. So here they are getting some more relics for you. They freed the head of Stephen, the martyr who died in Acts 17, from the evil clutches of Islam. Also on this crusade, they rescued a thorn from Christ's crown. They also found, here's where they found Mary's girdle. You never know when you're going to need Mary's girdle, so you might as well you find it. You might as well take it. You may need it for something. They found a towel that Christ girded himself with. I shared some of this, but this is the crusade when they found a lot of this stuff. The finger of Thomas, the head of James, the tear that Christ shed on the cross, and then they found, this is where they found some of the blood that he shed. I mean, pretty, pretty amazing. Um, one man, Stephen... Uh, Runciman, he wrote in 1954 in the history of the Crusades, Crusades on page 130, here was his comment on the Fourth Crusade. He said there was never a greater crime against humanity than the Fourth Crusade. So all these are held in, in negative light by a lot of people, and rightfully so. It was a waste of time. It, 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 nothing. And you say, why are you giving us all this? Because it's, it's a foundation for the period we're in. We're going to lay all this, and next week, I promise, I, I feel like, I know history can be somewhat tedious at times, but all this plays in a, fa a factor into things, and we got to get it. And next week, we're going to look at all the biblical, the, the true biblical lines. So uh, you got something to look forward to. The Fifth Crusade, twelve twelve A.D. It's led by Nicholas. I want to say Cologne because it's spelled about the same, but Nicholas of Cologne, which is C O L O G N E, Germany. Nicholas of. If anyone knows what that town and city is in Germany, you can tell me if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Cologne, Germany, and Stefan of. Uh, Cloyes, France. Stephen of Cloyes, France. And this is probably the most tragic crusade because this is the children's crusade. Don't know if you knew there was a children's crusade, but there was one and it was the fifth crusade. So here's what happens. A 12-year-old shepherd boy, Stephen of Cloyes, had a vision to round up all the children. of. So here's a man. He has a vision that he's supposed to round up all the children of Europe. It was children having visions that set up the Lady of Fatima, which produced the Cold War, Korea, and Vietnam. So there's a problem with these children visions people have, and uh, especially if you let children have visions and, and lead things. But he has his vision. It's supposed to round up all the children of Europe. Uh, if, you want a, if you want a further reading of what I mentioned there with Vietnam and Cold War in Korea, there is a book called Vietnam, Why Did We Go? It's by Avril Manhattan. Avril Manhattan writes some very, very phenomenal book dealing with Vietnam if you're ever interested in looking at anything to do with Vietnam. But, but that regards that. But this shepherd boy had a letter for the king of France that was apparently from Jesus Christ. So he gets a letter from Jesus Christ. The king tells the boy to go home. But he has a letter from God. He gathered a following and crossed the Alps to meet with the Pope, Pope Innocent III. When the Pope saw the letter and heard the vision, he called all of the parents of Europe and told them what good God could not do through men, he was going to do through children. And 30,000 little boys and girls were sent 
to go and fight the Turks. They traveled south to the Mediterranean Sea where they believed that the sea would part like the Red Sea did for Moses. Wonder where they got that idea. It didn't part. Two unscrupulous merchants, Hugh the Iron and William of Poscarez, offered them free passage to the Holy Land. That was Hugh the Iron and William of Poscarez offered them free passage to the Holy Land on seven ships. They sailed instead uh, to Tunisia where they were sold into slavery, slavery <clears throat> to the Mohammedans. There is no account of any of them actually reaching the Holy Land. So they're going to go fight this. They're going to get the Holy Land. They never even made it there. They get sold into slavery. Over 30,000 that went, only a few thousand ever returned home. When faced with the disaster, you need to get this tonight, when faced with the disaster of why the youth activity had flopped, you know what he did? You know what Pope Innocent did? Pope Innocent said that the kid had been deceived by a letter forged by the Albigensians. The Albigensians is our Bible line of people. He said the Albigensians forged a letter, got that kid to do it, and that's why we bit. And you know what happened. And he used that as a reason to raise a crusade to butcher, murder, and kill Bible-believing Christians. That's how it works. He says, nope, them Christians did it over there. And then they, now they've got, now what you're reading in Fox Book of Martyrs, some of that stuff that you're, you're seeing why is things like that that played into it. Why people have had so much hatred. Well, you got 30,000 kids that went missing. Only a few thousand ever made it back. Some of them are slaves. Some of them are murdered, dead. They died from sea and peril and all that stuff. You're going to have some mad parents. Well, I don't want to deal with that. We'll blame it on the Albigensians. Well, lo and behold, that didn't work out good for the Albigensians. Uh, it's like Pope John Paul when he visited uh, Auschwitz in 1979 and placed a wreath at the wall of death, I'm going to give you this one tonight. He, vi he visits Auschwitz in 1979 and places a wreath at the wall of death. The news never mentioned anything that it was the Roman Catholic Church that helped put Hitler in power through the center party. There was an article not, not very long ago in the Kansas City Star about all, how all of these leading Nazis... An article in the Kansas City Star not that long ago. All these leading Nazis escaped Europe after the war through a Roman Catholic monastery with forged papers dressed as priests and fled to South America called the Odessa Program. Nobody cares about that stuff. That's a big deal. You've got all, you've got all these men, these Nazis, I mean murdering Nazis, and they're escaping Europe after the war. How are they doing that? Through a Roman Catholic monastery with forged papers and they're dressed as priests. That's, that's sad. They fled to South America. But you, you, and you see the, the ignorance there. John Paul visiting Auschwitz places this wreath at the wall of death like he's some big pious and gives a rip about all the Jews that got murdered. And the news ain't going to tell you, yeah, he had a concordance with the Pope. Uh, Adolf Hitler, catechized Catholic. Heinrich Hilmer, catechized Catholic. All them guys, Catholics, through and through. Well, where, where, how did they get over there? I mean, where do you think all this stuff comes from, brethren? And, and nobody cares. Nobody cares. Called the Odessa program. Nobody cares about that stuff. So I was giving you that in comparison with, with well, the Albigens and Forges letter. Give it, so we're going to murder them. And then everything's hush-hush. The blame's all shifted. No one ever really knew who it was or why it happened. Same concept with, um, with the, um, well, my mind just drew a blank, with Hitler and, and the Jews and all that. I mean, same concept. Someone else got the blame. It's someone else's problem. Someone else's fault. Sixth Crusade, 1228 A.D. It's led by Frederick II and William of Holland. These last three are going to go real fast. Not much to them. The Sixth Crusade was led by Frederick II. He was joined by William of Holland. Frederick decided that... Uh, Discretion was a better part of valor, so he made a deal with the Muslims to split Jerusalem and set himself up as king on March 19th of 1229. So he, he makes a deal with them, splits it. They, him and the Muslims, they split Jerusalem. He makes himself king March 19th, 1229. Pope Gregory, not wanting anyone to be on the throne of Jerusalem besides himself, he excommunicated old Freddy, got him out of there. So um, ain't no one going to be on the throne but the Pope. Seventh Crusade, 1248 A.D., Louis of France, almost an inter entire army was wiped out with no gains and little damage to the Muslims. Total flop. That's all you need in short form of, of the Seventh Crusade. Eighth Crusade, um, man, I've got to get my... Uh, it's led by Louis of France and Charles uh, of Naples. The last crusade was again, by, again led by Louis of France. He faced off against the uh, Bybars, the, the one-eyed panther. The crusades can be summed up by a letter written by Bars, the one-eyed panther, to the prince of Antioch. And I've got the letter here. And he, um, what time are we at? Where are we at? 743. 743? Yeah, we're real close. I, I, Y'all care if I give you the letter? No, no. Here's what he wrote. Two weeks later, after Antioch fell to the Muslims, at the end of May, a letter arrived at the castle of Tripoli uh, for Bohemond. It was brought by an unarmed Muslim 
uh, not the sultan in disguise this time who disappeared after it was taken from him. Uh, Bohemond, opening the missive, beheld at the foot of it by a bar's heavy signature. And when he had read through the, when he read read it through, he sat without moving or speaking, as if stunned by an unseen blow. When his companions knew the contents of the letter, amazement and sorrow kept them silent. The letter was the mas masterpiece of the versatile Sultan. Greeting to the count, it began, and commiseration upon his misfortune inflicted by Allah, who hath deprived him of his princedom and left to him for consolation only, only his countship, no, no count, thou who believest thyself to be prince of Antioch, thou art not for we are lord of Antioch, thy rich and fruitful city. Sword in hand, we swept through the city on the fourth hour of Saturday, the fourth day of Ramadan. If thou hadst seen thy knights rolled under the hoofs of our horses, thy palaces trampled by the plunders who filled their bags with booty, thy treasures weighed out by the heaviest weights, thy fair women hawked in the streets at four for a diner, which is less than a penny, and bought with thine own gold. If thou hadst seen thy churches broken in, their crosses shattered, their lying gospels tossed from hand to hand, in the open under the sun, the tombs of thy noble forefathers overturned, while thy foe, the Muslims, trod upon thy holy of holies, slaughtering monks and priests and deacons like sheep, leading out the rich to misery and nobles to thy blood, of thy blood to slavery. Couldst thou have seen the flames licking up thy halls, thy dead cast into the flames temporal, while the flames eternal awaited them, uh, the churches of the apostles rocking and going down, thou wouldst then wouldst thou have said, O oh God, that I were dust. So he sends him a letter and says, Hey, buddy, here's what happened. If you'd have seen that, you'd have said, O oh God, that I were dust. Since no man of thine hath escaped to tell thee the tale, I tell it thee. He's saying, We slaughtered every one of your boys, and I'm going to tell you what happened. And you should have just not stuck your nose where it belonged. And that's what happens. And there he sits in, in dissolution, completely taken, taken back. And this way, the panther ended the... In this way, the panther ended the dispute as to who was going to own Jerusalem, who was going to have it. So uh, that brings us to the end of the Crusades. Some guys, they'll count 12 Crusades when you break them down in all the little subparts, but, but I've given you eight of them. That's typically how you'll view them in history. You can break them down into as many as 12 when you start getting subparts and this and that, but we're covering a lot of time real fast. So once, like I said before, the Crusades can be summed up like this. God wills it, running smack dab into it is the will of Allah. So that, that that's all the Crusades are. They were a flop, waste of time. I'm going to say this. We, we only got a couple things left we're going to look at, but I'm going to say this. The greatest threat on earth by this time in history, we've got two two clear lines. I wrote them down there in the top corner. We've got the true biblical line. We've got the anti-biblical line. That's what I've been trying to show you above all else through all church history, the two lines, and help you try to keep that distinction and make them known, like pay attention to that on top of what we'll look at later on when we get into uh, the Philadelphian church age and we start looking at denominations and things like that briefly. I'm not going to spend tons of time in that. We're going to get a little historical uh, dates and things, but, but pretty much anything outside of Baptist and Catholic, it, it started in America. Mormons, uh, Church of Christ, Pentecost, all that stuff, it started over here. It's not something old that's been around forever and ever and ever and ever. It all started uh, over here. So uh, we've seen where many of the religions get their start from, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Islam, and Roman Catholicism. So I've showed you uh, a lot of that to the best of my ability. Uh, the real threat, honestly, tonight, I want, I want you all to get this. The real threat's not really the Muslims. Now, I know we worry about terrorist attack and, and all these things and them killing and blowing up and all blah, 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 which half of it, who even knows if it's really what it is. But I'm just telling you that is not the greatest threat tonight. The greatest threat tonight is not the nuclear war. It's not, it's not anything. It is Satan's church. That is the greatest threat tonight is Satan's church, right? I mean, does the devil run the Muslims? Absolutely. Are they his group? Absolutely, hands down. There's people, there's group, but they're not his church. Just like uh, JWs and all these people, they're, they're spawns of groups that the devil controls, but they're not his true church. They're not the great whore of Babylon. That, 
that is the threat tonight. And, I, and like I say, I'm not trying to knock any. You may you may find an individual Catholic who's been saved and they're really born again. You may find that. I'm knocking the whole thing in its entirety. That is the threat tonight. That is the danger. That is why you're seeing take place what you're seeing today. Jesuit infiltration, things of that nature. People rewriting history, changing things, trying to flip everything. Satan is a deceiver. He's a counterfeiter. He will make it look like God. He'll make it look of God. And so we know this. He's got he, he's got their He's got a Bible, he got a church, he got disciples, he got all the same stuff God's got, but one's wrong and the other one's right. And you've got to get that down tonight. So uh, in the tribulation period, when the devil and the person of the Antichrist sits down in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, we know that from 2 Thessalonians, the devil finally gets what he wants. And when he gets it, then it'll be through the Roman Catholic Church. He wasn't satisfied getting it through the Muslims. He won't be satisfied getting it through the JWs. He won't be satisfied getting it through the Mormons. They are rinky-dink religions that don't even appear on the Richter scale of the devil's main cause. They don't. I mean, yeah, they play a fact into apostasy. They play into a fact into misleading people and this and that. But no one even comes close to the Roman Catholic Church. You've got to get that down in your head tonight. The devil's main sphere of operation is his church. His church has their own Bible. They got their own priests. They got their own religious services. They have everything under themselves, and he will not be satisfied until he sits down in Jerusalem with his church in charge. So you got to get that. Uh, the things we'll look at finishing up tonight. Uh, the the last list there: Catholic groups. Uh, I know it's hard for some people to hear in this age. I don't, you never know anymore who you're preaching to, but. It is what it is. We ain't going to not address it. But we're going to look at old ones and then the grandsons of those today as we know them. So you had the Knights of St. John, also called um, Hospitallers. I'm going to read through these because I want you to have their background. Some of them short, some of them's a little bit lengthy, but nothing like the Crusades were. The Order of St. John were extremely wealthy individuals that were granted immense privileges by the Pope. They were French. They were organized in 1099 A.D., that's when they started, the Knights of St. John, 1099 A.D., during the First Crusade after they took Jerusalem. They were fa founded by Gerard Tum, G-E-R-A-R-D, Tum, T-U-M, started in uh, Gerard Tum, his lifespan. If you want to pin it down, you don't got to. It's 1040 A.D. to 1120 A.D. When Jerusalem fell in 1187 A.D., they moved to the city of Acre. When Acre fell in 1291 A.D., they fled to Cyprus. The order fell into decay around 1500 A.D. is when the Knights of St. John kind of came into decay. One some of y'all have heard, if you watch, I like the Disney movies, uh, uh, National Treasure, you kind of hear deal with some of this stuff, the Knights of Knights Templar, uh, things of that nature. They were organized around 1119 A.D. Knights Templar organized around 1119 A.D. They were from the Rhine, Germany, or Alsace, Alsace, Lorraine, which is northern France. The order was founded by Hugo de Pions and Bernard of Clairvaux. The Knights Templar was the wealthiest of the military orders. The head of this order was called a Grand Master. That's a familiar term still used today. The head of the order was called a Grand Master. Sounds like Freemasons. They have a Grand Master. And in 1139 A.D., Pope Innocent II exempted them from all taxes and obedience to all laws and authority except the Pope. The Knights Templar met a tragic end in 1312 A.D. after their membership had reached 9,000. King Philip of France, due to his financial debt to the order, decided to have them disbanded. The Templars were charged with spitting on the cross, denying Christ, worshiping idols, homosexuality, financial corruption, fraud, and secrecy. The King, Pope Clement, and the Dominican Order of Monks lined up against them in France. 36 of them died under torture, 54 of them were burned at the stake, and hundreds of them perished in prison. Clement issued the decree abolishing the order on March 22, 1312. March 22, 1312, they were abolished. All of their property and wealth was split between the church and state official. And you had the Teutonic Knights. The last order was the Teutonic Knights. They were from Germany. They were founded in 1190 A.D. by Grandmaster Heinrich Walpott von Bassenheim. The order hired mercenaries from its extreme wealth to aid in the battles. In the battles, they would accept surrender if the enemy agreed to be baptized as a Roman Catholic. You might want to remember that. They would accept surrender if he agreed to be baptized as a Roman Catholic. Any of you ladies or any, if any of you men are reading Fox's Book of Martyrs, you'll see some of them um, ultimatums. If you'll recant, you'll, you'll come across a lady, and I, I should remember her name because I've read it and I've heard her quote many a times. I, I want to say she was 19 years old, 
She she had her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They said, if you'll recant, we won't burn you at the stake. We won't kill you. And she said something along the lines about God being faithful to her all 19 years of her life or whatever, and she wasn't there. No, they, they said, uh, if you'll recant and be baptized or whatever, you, you'll become Catholic, we'll let you live. And, and, and you have to go to Mass. And she said, if I go to Mass, I'm afraid I'll see the devil there. <laughs> and uh, It didn't work out good for her. So, uh, but, you know, we... And, and I laugh. It's kind of humorous, too, as well. But you think about it, that girl had more faith than most people in your right. American church today. Right. Could ever, I don't give a rip what they say and what they're about to do. You, you're going to, on, on top of the the sort of sadness that you find in, not sort of, it is sad, it, that you find in Fox the Book of Martyrs, on top of that, you're also going to find some very profound and sort of, uh, I don't know what the word is, things that just stir you up, that, that just really help you and encourage you. You you you'll read about I, I forget my my mind is horrible. But one of the old men I forget his name. They said you know clap will you clap if if you can stand the flames because they they were his buddies. They knew if he was going it just a matter of time before they went. And brethren he burnt there for a minute and clapped his hand three times and let him know he can withstand the flames. It was going to be all right. You read stuff like that. That's just you know borderline. I don't want to say heroic. But in terms of faith, yeah, it was pretty heroic. Just, just the testimony they give uh, to the other people that was going to probably end up suffering the same persecution. So anyway, they would accept surrender if the enemy agreed to be baptized as a Roman Catholic. They were later used in wars against Prussia, Poland, uh, Lithu Lithuania, and Russia. The order began to decline after the Teutonic War with the Poland and Lithuania, 1409 uh, through 1411. All of these groups were courted by the popes made rich by the kings, and idolized by the people. The Pope gave them great favors. He used them as pro, pro, paramilitary groups. But when they became of no value to the Pope or became too powerful, he wiped them out. So uh, it wasn't so much as all the time when there's no value anymore. When they get a little bit too powerful and the Pope feels a little bit threatened, you got to do something there. Now we're going to finish up with these last three, and they'll be quick. Uh, but the modern-day grandsons of these groups will be found in a couple of groups today. You and all, we, we've heard of these groups, Knights of the Columbus. They started on March 29, 1882 A.D. in New Haven, Connecticut by Father Michael McGivney. The Knights of Columbus are the modern-day version of the Knights uh, Templar and the Teutonic Knights. They're fifth column sub, uh, subversive group in America. They're very political. They mask their subversion by doing a lot of charitable works going to be like the other two, really, that we deal with, the Masons and the Shriners. There's the final two for the night. Uh, out of these groups also comes the Masons and the Shriners. They take their heritage out of the Teutonic Knights. You have to be a master, master Mason first to join the Shriners. Of course, they don't see the connection to the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, a lot of the higher-ups may know that, but your average, you know, lower-degree Shriner or, or lower-degree Mason, I'm sorry, I don't remember how that works. I, I had a lot of Good friends when I first got saved that I worked with that were in the Blue Lodge, they were Freemasons, and they were that close to me joining the Blue Lodge. And lo and behold, I got saved right about a month before any of that could have took place. And so I was right on the brink. I mean, they had me talked into it. They had it all talked up. Seemed like a great He-Man Woman Haters Club. Amen. I mean, really, that's what they are, a bunch of He-Man Woman Haters Club. They meet in their little clubhouse and do their little things. And I don't mean any disrespect, but you got people like Brother Gary that used to be a Shriner. He can tell you all about it. You want to know some of the bad stuff that goes on. I've got... Uh, I've got an uncle that got pretty high up in the Shriners, and and it's all just a big secret. I mean, it's almost w w when it's when it's family, you get almost irritated. Like, who do you think you are? you know? Number one, trying to well, it's a secret. I can't tell you that stuff. I I don't give a flip about none of that stuff. Really, I care less. What I know, what most of them doing, they're um, cheating on their wives. A lot of them, I know that for a fact. They're getting drunk. I mean, bad drunk, and they're doing a lot of things they shouldn't be doing. I know I know enough. A factual testimonies that that happens. I'm not saying they're all that way. I'm not saying every Shriner's like that, but it's just real hard to be yoked up with that stuff and you not be influenced by it. You better you better watch it. If you if, if I was if I was a Christian, if I was saved, I, I am, but I'm using this hypothetical. I would I would start pumping my brakes with that stuff and I'd pay attention. There's yeah. some weird weird dark stuff going on there, and it stems from the Roman Catholic Church. I know, I know a lot of people that can't stand the Roman Catholic Church, but they're a, they're a Freemason or a Shriner. But I, I've got family. I've got, well, on one side, my i got an aunt, her ex-husband, so he's not really blood-related, but they're about as high up as you can go in the Shriners. I mean, they pretty much run the Shrine Mosque there at Springfield. I mean, they're they're way up the, the chain and weird. I, I don't know how to be, I can't be nice. They're weirdos. There's something weird going on, and it's, there's a lot of freaky stuff. But same deal, we'll look at that. The Masons get a lot of attention by the conspiracy group as the main group working behind the scenes. But some of that's a smoke, smoke screen. They've got a lot of power. They've got a lot of influence. 
but really the Roman Catholic Church, it's all a smokescreen stuff. You gotta, you gotta pay attention. But they're all used to mask what I just said. They're all used to mask the actions of the Devil's Church. Even though the Shriners today are an independent group, they trace their origins back to the Teutonic Knights and Knights Templar. From there, they trace it back to King Solomon's Temple in the Bible. I mean, they'll all tell you that it's all bogus. It's what they do, but it's all bogus. These groups are set up just like they were in the Crusades. Same thing. They had a Grand Master, which headed up the group. They do a lot of good works and help a lot of people. But all that is a smokescreen, just like the groups during the Crusades. I mean, Shriner's Hospital. I mean, they, uh, that, that guy that almost converted me to it, he, that, that was one of their bragging things. Man, we help all these kids with this. And they do. They help a lot of people. I'm not going to take that away from them. God can use anybody. Reprobate, degenerate. He can use anything to help somebody out and bless somebody. 1,000%. But I tell you this, I got saved, and they were still, you know, hounding on me about it. And I, I was, still, I mean, I was a baby in Christ. I didn't have no idea about none of this stuff. And as far as I knew, it was all just innocent, fun, and games, no harm, no foul type stuff. But I asked them, you know, like, you, you got to be initiated in because you can't be a Shriner until you're in the Blue Lodge. You have to be in the Blue Lodge so long, hit a certain degree. I think I, I, I don't know if it's a certain degree, but I know you have to be in the Blue Lodge before you can even get into the Shriners. And I'm, so I'm, I'm still asking questions. I'm like, well, what do I got to do? You have to, you have to stand, you have to come to one of the meetings and sort of they'll, you know, accept you or whatever. And you've got to take this oath or whatever. And I ask him about the oath and, and you don't have to confess, you, you confess belief in a higher power. You don't, you don't, you don't distinguish the Lord Jesus Christ, God of the Bible. You don't distinguish that. It's a higher being or a higher power. And then the more little bit of details he starts giving me surrounding that, I'm like, no, I think I'm good for now. I, I mean, I'll do my own research and we'll, you know, stop and ask questions. <laughs> Figure out if something you need to be entangled with. And just what little bit he did, it was like, even as a baby in Christ, the Holy Ghost immediately triggered something. He said, now you probably need to, you need to, you need to get away from that. But all these groups come out of the Roman Catholic Church during the Crusades. Plain and simple. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's just a fact of history. Something that's, easy. And, and, and like I said, I know Shriners do a lot of good work. I know they help a lot of people out. I'm not taking that away from them. But what I'm giving you is historical facts and things that are involved with that. And just because somebody might be a good person and they might be nice, it don't mean that what they're yoked up with and what they're involved in may not be completely godless and wicked at the same time. It, it just, you know, when, when you look at people in general, and I'm finished with this, you look at people in general, they all want to have this belief that they're going to be good enough to get to heaven. And so you take people like the Shriners and they do all these good works and they help all these kids with wheelchairs and dis afford things they can't get. And I'm all for it. That's a great work. I'm not not. I'm all for that stuff. Help people out if you can. If you got the money, do it. But people like that in the back of their mind, well, a good God wouldn't send us to hell if we did all that stuff for somebody. And that's just not the reality tonight. The reality is you die without Christ, you go to hell. I mean, just plain and simple. So uh, that's the end for tonight. Next week, we'll jump into part two. Uh, and we're going to look, like I said, Hope you're excited. I, I, I'm definitely excited next week because we're going to look at the true biblical line groups, lots of them, and we're also going to get to look at some individuals. So uh, something to look forward to tonight.